Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another UDI Okanagan webinar. Just going to give a minute or so for a number of participants to come into this Zoom call. So we will get started momentarily. I see we have a number of attendees coming in. Great. Great, thank you for everybody who is joining the webinar today. Looks like we are getting close to our expected attendance. So uh, without any further ado, I will start our webinar. And I want to welcome everybody today and certainly as well to our speakers and our sponsors to join our UDI Okanagan webinar on the future of energy in Canada with Satvinder Flore. Uh, sorry, Senator Flora. Uh, I, uh, I myself, I am Luke Turi. I am the chair of UDI Okanagan, and uh, very pleased to uh, be part of this session today. I think this will be a very interesting topic for our members, talking about things like our energy systems and our power grids, and potentially even how we need to think about real estate in new ways uh, into the future and as it relates to energy. So, there's, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of good conversation both in the presentation and as well in the Q&A. So um, I just want to, before we introduce our sponsor, uh, like we have done for a number of our webinars, please uh, add any questions you have for the Q&A after the, uh, the formal part of the presentation. And uh, we'll be sure to facilitate as many questions as we can uh, before our time at around 1.30. And at this time, I would like to recognize our title sponsor, Canadian Western Bank. And we, of course, very much appreciate all of our sponsors who are helping support uh, our, our webinars and events during this time. Canadian Western Bank is a Schedule One bank with close to 2.5 billion in market capitalization. CWB was founded by entrepreneurs in 1985, and they remain centered on helping business, business owners grow. They are on a journey to become the best full service bank for business owners in Canada. Headquartered out of Edmonton, their loan portfolio is very well diversified across Canada. BC at 33%, Alberta at 32%, Ontario at 27%, and Saskatchewan and Manitoba at 8%. They recently opened their flagship branch in Mississauga. Last year, they grew their commercial loans by 15% and their branch deposits by 12%. They offer a full spectrum of products in general commercial banking, construction and real estate financing, retail banking, cash management, wealth management, equipment financing, aviation financing, leasing solutions, and trust services. At this time, I'd like to welcome Rama Aluri from Canadian Western Bank to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Luke. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Rama Aluri, District VP for uh, Interior BC at CWB. Uh, thank you for giving Canadian Western Bank the opportunity to be the presenting sponsor for, uh, for today's event. Today, we have an excellent guest speaker, uh, Satwinder Flora. Satwinder leads the Energy Resources and uh, Industry National Business for WSP in Canada with an extensive background in international oil and gas, power, and industrial sectors. Satwinder has held senior level executive roles across North America and Europe with the focus on business development strategy, operational planning, and mergers and acquisitions. Satwinder moved from UK to Canada in 2008 and holds a BA honors from the University of York. Satwinder is active in the business community and has supported UK and Canadian government agencies in an advisory capacity on energy, trade, and international investment. I'll now pass it back to Luke. Thanks very much, Rama. So at this time, without any further ado, I'd like to pass things on to Sadender and I welcome you to share your screen as well. Look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Luke. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, everything sounds great. Fantastic. And I will just bring up my screen here. And if you can see it, then that's all good. <clears throat> great. Looks great. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Luke. Okay. 
Thank you very much, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. Um, it is really rather surreal to be staring into a computer screen, knowing that there's lots of people on the other side of it. But that is the way of things in the last year. So I think it's going to be not only what we've had over the last year, but probably in some ways the shape of things to come. So I hope this is an informative, uh, informative topic for you. Uh, Canada's energy future. Um, I could have said what's going on with Canadian energy or what's going to happen with Canadian energy and make it a bit more controversial, but being, being British and muted, I thought I'd keep it rather generic and, uh, and simple. So let's, let's talk about why I'm here and uh, my credentials to be able to talk to you. Um, so let's just see if I can click on this. There we go. All right. So firstly, I represent WSP uh, as uh, I was introduced um, by Rama. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, WSP is a technical consultant. Um, we specialize in, in project and project management, but we provide technical expertise and strategic advice into clients in the energy and resources and industrial sphere, which is what I look after. I've got about a thousand people in Canada that specialize in that sort of work internationally. Um, but we also look at transportation, infrastructure, and the environmental sectors, and we have a large buildings practice. Um, we're a Canadian company. Our global revenue is about $9 billion, a market cap of about $13.5 billion. Um, one of the biggest Canadian companies that you may not have heard of, actually, headquartered in Montreal, and we are a, a significant international player in the built environment. So why am I here? Um, three reasons. Um, well, I'm here literally because I came to Canada in 2008 for 18 months and I stuck around. I quite like the place. I really enjoy it here. Uh, I think it's a fantastic place with um, huge, huge resources, great potential, superb people. Um, I've worked from coast to coast. Um, I've worked in BC, I've worked in Alberta, um, and I've worked all the way through to the, to the Maritimes. Um, absolutely love it here. Um, <clears throat> second reason I'm here is, um, as well as being the head of energy and resources at WSP, I really enjoy the energy sector. I'm a, I'm a, a passionate energy devotee. Um, I've worked in the energy sector for 20 years um, in renewables, nuclear, oil and gas, petrochemicals, um, energy across the, across the platform. Uh, as you heard in my introduction, I've also been an advisor to the government on energy, uh, both in the UK and Canada. Why am I passionate about energy? Um, energy supports our economies. It drives innovation and development. And ultimately, it powers all other industry. It's the stem from which all other things flow. And importantly, it correlates with some fundamentals. It correlates with life expectancy. It correlates with GDP per capita. And while affordable access to energy doesn't always guarantee democratization and human rights, its absence always erodes both. Um, sadly, I was one of the few that did predict the oil crash in 2014 and the effect that that would have on the Canadian economy, particularly the economy in Alberta and BC. Um, <clears throat> and what was true then is still true now, but it it was not down to Saudi Arabia turning on the taps. Um, the patient, Canadian oil in that instance, was already critical when the Saudi Arabian juggernaut hit us. So second reason I'm here is that I understand Canadian energy, particularly over the last sort of 12, 15 years and the direction it's going. Um, and I'm an honest broker of energy solutions, no vested interest in any. I'm, I'm, I'm very much about solving the problem of energy and I'm surrounded by a group of technical professionals who are committed to the same aim. The third reason is, um, is actually uh, Renee Merrifield. Um, I bumped into Renee on, an, on a flight to Montreal, uh, probably the last flight I took actually before COVID. Um, and we had a great conversation about energy and, and uh, she thought it might be quite a good idea to share the conversation that we had with those assembled here. So I'm looking forward to that. So without further ado, let's go on to the subject of the talk. And what I've entitled it is Canada's, Canada's Energy Transition. In order to know where we're going, it's really quite important to view it in the context of a trend. And really the trend between 2010 and 2030. 2010, the conversation was very much around the oil sands, around the development of oil in Canada, huge investments in oil. And now we've seen a major shift towards electrification, towards renewables, uh, towards a world where we have to decarbonize very intensively and very quickly. And that's happening in between 2010 and 2030, when right in the middle of that transition. And actually, Canada's journey between 2020 and 2030 is really a microcosm of what's happening in the world. So I'm quite excited to talk about it. And I think it's conveniently labeled from Exxon to Elon. Um, 
And I'll explain why I've said that, but it's pretty obvious and it's fairly tongue in cheek, but it's true. Uh, the story has really gone from a story around ExxonMobil to a story around Elon Musk and everything that Elon represents. And the real shift in that started to happen around about 2016. So let me explain that in a little bit more detail. But again, the purpose for this presentation is really, it's a primer to energy and energy systems, hopefully some thought provoking commentary to demystify the complexity of energy systems and to build a story through a timeline and transitions are all about a timeline and energy transition is no exception. So let's look at, let's look at that. What was the Canadian energy landscape from 2010 onwards to 2016? Well, what's true then is true now. The third largest oil reserve in the world behind Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and the 17th largest gas reserve. 1.3 trillion cubic feet. That is no small thing. That's a significant, significant resource. And why is oil important? Well, <clears throat> even now, um, 100 million barrels a day being produced around the world. Um, in 2020 with COVID, that's probably gone to about 92 million barrels. But the daily consumption of oil is 60, 62,500 barrels a second. I just want some time to just for that to sink in. 62,500 barrels a second right now, even with reduced capacity. An Exxon invested $23 billion in one project in Canada, a project called Curl, which is an oil sands mine in Alberta uh, in 2010. I actually worked on that project as a transitional phase manager. That project was the largest project on the planet. And there was a huge amount that was invested, and they weren't alone. At that time, there were five or six projects that were lined up behind it to, um, to be equal in size. Suncor with Fort Hills, which did go through, um, Equinox by Tech, Frontier by Tech, uh, Jocelyn, Total. Um, they didn't happen. <clears throat> Probably a good thing they didn't happen, but they didn't happen. Good to explain why. The largest outbound investment from China, the world's you know, fastest growing economy, the largest outbound investment was in Canada. Between 2010 and 2015, China invested the largest outbound investment anywhere in the world into Canada through the acquisition of Nexon, through the acquisition of Daylight Energy, and also through the birth of Bryan Energy, which eventually got rebranded to PetroChina, and, and a huge amount of investment in potential LNG projects. And then between 2014 and between 2012 and 2016, um, the potential for LNG projects, LNG projects tabled for British Columbia that were ranging between two and 40 million tons per annum. Um, and at the time, Christy Clark, um, who I knew very well, was very keen on ensuring that investment came to, to British Columbia. Now, she held a mission to Japan, which I was part of, to try and encourage uh, foreign investment in, in, uh, in Canadian gas which actually would have been excellent because it would have displaced the coal production that's now currently going on in China. And um, gas, uh, burning gas for power has half the greenhouse gas emissions associated with coal. It's a significant investment in reducing uh, coal-fired stations. So actually just by way of example, in 2020, uh, China approved enough coal capacity just in that year uh, to power Germany an equivalent uh, size to Germany. That's a significant amount of coal that could be reduced by displacing it through natural gas. So hundreds of billions of cap uh, dollars of capital uh, investment plan didn't really materialize. Only one survived, LNG Canada. And uh, like beyond Fort Hills, nothing beyond Exxon. So what actually happened? What, was the, what were the reasons for that? And I think that gives us an idea of where we've come from. And, it, and I think it's really important to know because it is part of our landscape in Canada. Firstly, the international competition for capital. Um, let's take oil. 100,000 barrels of oil produced uh, competes across three markets, uh, onshore oil production, offshore shallow production, and deep water production. And my background is, is offshore shallow and deep water in the North Sea in the UK. Um, the development cost in Canada is really out of whack. So when the head of Shell Canada sits around the boardroom in The Hague and speaks with his or her colleagues about, and it's going to be her colleagues shortly, uh, about investment in Canada, um, they will talk about 
putting 100,000 barrels out the ground. And typically it costs between 1.5 and $3.5 billion, whether it's onshore, offshore or deep. In Canada, that cost is about 9 billion. Uh, Shell did manage to pull it off for 6 billion in 2006, but with inflation, it's actually probably about 9 billion. And that's if you're doing it in multiple phases. It's much more expensive here. So there are high development costs. The regulatory environment is, is difficult, but it's actually the best regulatory environment in the world for development because uh, there's regulations about land usage, there's regulations about emissions, there's regulations about remediation afterwards. It is the most regulated oil and gas environment in the world. And that's, that's quite, quite right, and it should be. Um, so that was the first. The second, why the cost so high? Well, it's labor cost, productivity, and availability. Most expensive engineering and construction costs anywhere in the world. Um, Sadly, the lowest tier productivity. Um, if you can benchmark can Canadian productivity in the uh, oil and gas construction markets um, and engineering, uh, productivity has gone up in Canada by about uh, 15 to 20% since 1995. That puts it on a marker with, with uh, Italy, it puts it on a marker with uh, some parts of Australia. Um, but if you compare that with, say, Germany or France, uh, they've gone up about 150% since 1995 through use of new CAD technologies. Um, the US has gone up by about 250%. But to be fair, the US started with a lower base in 1995. But if you take a country like South Korea, it's gone up by about 500%. So you'll notice that as projects were kicked off in Canada, a lot of the engineering work went to South Korea because it was seen as more productive. But ultimately, the lack of resources here are the things that, that drive, drive up costs, particularly lack of human resources. And I'll explain that. So Canada, Canada's energy market has been driven by what we call mega project. And mega, mega project capacity is a very difficult thing. So if you take the project I mentioned by ExxonMobil, when ExxonMobil invested the $23 billion that they did, at peak, they probably had about eight to 10,000 people on site. Now, if you imagine three of those projects happening concurrently, that would be 30,000 people in the Athabasca region developing projects. Now, as well as being impractical, you don't have that many people working with those skills to be able to drive those projects. Um, also, it just drives up costs. There's the wage price spiral. It just keeps going up. So those projects become unfeasible. And as you can see, $9 billion of development cost. Now, the same is true. I used oil as an example, but the same is true with LNG, with natural gas. Um, Several projects were tabled for BC. Um, you'll probably remember them, West Coast Connect um, with uh, ExxonMobil. That was a 40 million ton per annum project. Nexon, Petrona, Chevron, Apache, I could go on. Um, and I was involved in the, in the shell development. Um, the interesting piece around that is that there was no way they were going to go forward anyway. Firstly, there's no way you can get enough resources to be able to build those projects. But secondly, if those projects had been developed, they would have fed world demand for natural gas, liquefied natural gas, five times over. There's, there just wasn't the demand for the amount, the capacity that was being spoken about. So then the, there's the next piece, and I'll talk about this with oil, but we can apply it to other markets as well. Demand. The demand for Canadian energy is a very complicated issue. Um, but the simple fact is that we only have one customer. So 99% of all Canadian oil and gas goes to one customer. And for that customer, the US, we are 50% of their uh, imports. So 50% of all US consumption is from Canada and it's 99% of all of our exports. That's important to realize. Um, and it's even more complicated than that because we've most of the, in fact, yeah, vast majority of the oil that we, we produce and send to the US is refined in the US. So we send syn crude to the US, synthetic crude to the US, which is, um, which is refined in the US and actually then sold back to us. Um, and it's bought from us at a discounted price and it's sold back to us at a bit of a premium. And largely it's because of refinery capacity. We don't have the refinery capacity in Canada, so the oil is refined there. So what happened? Why did this all change? Why did Exxon invest then, but you know, all these projects fail? Well, not only because of capacity, because of demand. US demand dropped by 22% in the last 10 years, and it dropped because they went from being a net importer of oil to a net exporter. And they did that through the emergence of a technology called fracking. They were able to frack wells at a fraction of the cost and be able to bring in liquids-rich gas that was essentially feeding their own domestic market. 
the discount remained. So Canadian oil is discounted on the international market, which is essentially the US, by about 15 to 20%, which really renders it very uneconomical. Now, demand for oil is going to fall further with transportation. We'll talk about that in terms of uh, electric cars. But I'll go forward with more headwinds that really affected the industry. Supply. Lots is spoken of about XL pipeline. Now, I'm not really going to talk more about XL pipeline because it's a bit of a red herring. XL pipeline takes, uh, takes, takes oil to um, the Gulf Coast where it will be exported internationally. And the capacity on that was about 850,000 barrels a day. Actually, that capacity was found. Um, whilst there were arguments about XL pipeline, capacity from Canada into the US um, was increased by about 800,000 barrels a day, roughly equivalent to XL pipeline. And it was on rail and it was supplying the US domestic, um, domestic market. Again, at a discount, um, but it was significant. Now, why do, I, why, do I, why do I say all this? Because it's really quite a weird situation. When I was explaining to um, my contacts within the UK government, you know, what I thought was gonna happen with XL pipeline, I said it wouldn't go forward. They all thought I was nuts because they said, well, why would you, why would you not have that? I mean, XL pipelines needed surely for the, for the whole system to grow particularly actually pipelines to, um, to the coast. So, you know, pipelines within Canada. And I had to explain that there are strong political and regulatory constraints um, that, you know, people are opposed to pipelines and for very good reason. There are very good reasons why people don't want to, to do this because there's no really assurance about safety and security, even though pipelines are the safest way to, to transport oil. And also there's some concerns really about our dependency on oil. But as I just said, even if we bring our dependency on oil down, we're still using a heck of a lot of it and Canada has a part to play because what's happening is actually we're importing oil from Saudi Arabia, from Russia um, and from other countries. We're actually importing oil from the US. So we're selling to the US at a discount in the West and buying it at a premium in the East as well as importing oil from Saudi and Russia and that's set to continue. So there are some intrinsic issues there. The other big issue was the oil price. 10 years ago, the oil price was over $100 a barrel. It went down last year to virtually nothing. And um, if we look at WTI right now, it's a sort of $50 to $60 a barrel. Access to Tidewater would remove the discount, but, and it would increase investment to some extent, but it's just not economical. I and mean, the return on investment in, in Canada certainly is, um, for an investor, uh, it's about 2%. Right, two percent if you invest in oil and gas. So a lot of conversation about oil and gas, but that's not the energy energy spectrum. Canada's got a lot more to say within energy. But what's true then is true now, which is essentially that this is why the oil market was really kind of depreciated massively over the last ten years. Then I'm going to mention some black swan events. So we're in a world where we need to decarbonize and decarbonize quickly. Fracking fundamentally changed things. I've mentioned demand in the US, demand in the US fell massively. Um, and that was being fed by supply internally within the US. So fracking fundamentally changed things. Now, up until 2016, that was still the case. And that's when Saudi Arabia turned on the pipes. But it wasn't the reason why the Canadian market fell, it was the reason why the American market fell. Fukushima. If we're going to decarbonize, we need to find alternative forms of energy and nuclear is a very automatic choice. It's dispatchable, it's non-intermittent, it can be done at scale, but it's not really going to affect us now until 2030, certainly, because after 2011 and the Fukushima incident, a number of new build nuclear power stations were taken off the market um, and they were taken off the development table. So we just won't be able to develop nuclear power quickly enough. Um, it takes about 10 years to bring a nuclear power plant online. Um, we just don't have the capacity. Right now to replace oil, we'd have to be developing 50 nuclear plants every year for the next 50 years. To replace oil, we'd have to be building 33,000 wind turbines a year for 50 years. To replace oil, we'd have to be putting in 91 million solar panels each year for 50 years. I just wanted to give some context on sizing. I'll, come, I'll bring those figures back. So let's look at the big mega trend, decarbonization we have to take a huge amount of carbon out of our atmosphere and oil is not helping us to do that. But the biggest culprit is coal by a factor of two. 
And let's just explain the kind of extent of that problem. So here are global greenhouse gas emissions by seg. And this, the last reliable number that we have is actually in 2016. So in 2016, you can see there's about 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. And most of it comes from energy. Um, and whether that's energy use in industry, energy use in transportation, use in buildings, residential buildings and commercial, huge amount of carbon dioxide. So in order to get rid of that carbon, there's been a huge shift in transportation towards electric vehicles, in buildings, towards heat pumps. Uh, and we've got just a huge amount of electrification going on. And providing the electricity can be produced cleanly, that's actually a good thing, and it does actually bring down emissions. But you can see that actually a fifth of, of carbon emissions actually come from, from agriculture. Um, and about 10% in total come from livestock farming associated with, with the rearing of beef. Um, so there's intrinsic issues here, but just to give you an idea, this is the total figure. If you remember the figure 50, about 50 gigatons of CO2 in 2016, slightly to go up to about 55 gigatons in 2022, and it's projected to be about 60 gigatons if we don't do anything about it in 2030. Here's what we've got to do, and here's the challenge, right? So this is, this is the challenge that we have in front of us. We've got to remove 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2030. Now, the last time we had carbon emissions that low was pre-1990. So let's just contextualize that. The last time we had that much, that, that, that little emission into the atmosphere was pre-1990 when we had less than 5.2 billion people. By 2030, we're going to have 8.5 billion people. So the challenge is we have to produce enough energy for 60% more people than 1990 with nearly 60% less emissions. That's a huge challenge. In other words, we're, we're now going to have 1.3 billion more people than we have right now, and we have to reduce emissions by 55%. That is a staggering challenge. And what we're doing is we're doing it in isolation. So we're looking at, for example, Canada reducing its emissions. But what I'd like to say is that actually our systems are interconnected. Emissions know no borders. So the challenge that's presented to us, and it's an existential challenge, is how do we generate non-intermittent, dispatchable and sustainable energy for a growing population while producing half our current GHG emissions by 20? And how do we do that? It's, it's, it's actually a very, very serious existential problem. If you don't understand non-intermittent or dispatchable, I'll explain those. Um, really, that's about the fact that the cleanest forms of energy that we have, solar and wind, are intermittent. They don't kind of come when we want them to, and they're not dispatchable. We can't get them where we want them at the times that we want them. But I'll explain that as we go forward. And I'll explain that through this. Here's our end-to-end -end view of the energy and electricity supply chain and how power is generated, solar, hydro, gas, oil, across the, across the piece. We then have transmission and distribution, we have storage, and then we have consumption. It's important to realize whatever I show you today, 60% of this goes to waste. 60% is lost through inefficient systems, through heat, through gas flaring, through venting, through all sorts of means by which essentially we're squandering energy. So put that another way, if we were to able to improve um, uh, the efficiency of systems that you know, are right now 40% efficient by, uh, by 50%, you could reduce emissions by 30%. It's, it's, it's a really quite, uh, quite stark what we could do with just reducing waste and making things more efficient. So the most renewable forms of electricity producing energy, solar and wind, are also the cheapest right now. So they're the cheapest um, means of producing electricity, but they're also the most difficult to scale, to transport and predict. And ultimately, they're a real estate play. Um, and we just don't have enough real estate. I think I mentioned to you how much, how many solar panels we need to, uh, to, to, to put in, how many wind farms we can put in. That's not to say that we won't. That's going to that's gonna increase. And actually, solar and wind have outpa outpaced all predictions for their growth over the last 10 years. They just have. So problems are dispatchability, where you want it, intermittency, when you want it, and scalability, the amount that you want. The next, hydro. Hydro is geographically dependent and expensive to maintain, and it has environmental impacts. There are actually GHG emissions associated with hydro dams. Um, 
Geothermal, tidal, osmotic energy are highly specialized. They're geographically dependent. Uh, nuclear, I mentioned, uh, is really a victim of Fukushima. It is a viable, dispatchable, sustainable means of being able to create power. Most of the power stations, which we've had problems with, this is a bit of a, an in secret in the nuclear world, they weren't created for power. They were created to create tritium for nuclear weaponry in the 1950s. The nuclear power stations that are available now and that are designed now are exceptionally safe. And there's a huge drive towards SMR, small modular reactors. Um, again, we won't get them in time for 2030. So whilst they're interesting, while it's academically true, there's a problem there. Coal is absolutely a non-starter. Coal has to be phased out in, in all, all ways, even if you're able to capture the carbon. Um, it, there is really, clean coal is in some ways a misnomer. Clean coal is too expensive. Coal in itself is too dirty. The only proven readily accessible way to bridge the gap right now is with, is with gas power. And gas power will be there for variability. So we're going to see a shift in terms of power generation to, to, to gas and, and a lot of it. And as long as you can sequester the gas, do it cleanly, capture the methane, convert it, actually gas is a, is a very meaningful way of being able to bridge the gap and reducing emissions. So I mentioned the, the generating assets issues. There's intermittency, dispatchability, sustainability, and, and capacity, right? The, the issue that with solar and wind, you just can't scale up to take out the alternative. As I mentioned, um, an equivalent of 62,500 barrels being, being consumed every second. We have to find some way of voluming up to meet that. Transmission and distribution. So as we move to electrification and there's a shift to electrification, the question is, what, does, what impact does that have on our, on our systems? Well, actually, there's going to be a massive requirement to improve our grid. As I said, lots wasted on the grid. So there's a wastage all the way through the system. We'd have to look at new routes, expanding the existing system, and grid upgrades. So let me give an example. Right now, the adoption rate of electric vehicles is pretty high. But they've reached, uh, if you look at it in Europe, they've reached about 3% penetration. In North America, they're about 2% penetration. And the adoption of new technology like electric vehicles from 0 to 5% is usually really slow. But once it hits 5, it skyrockets. And that's been true for pretty much any new technology that's been viable, uh, whether it's been TV sets, whether it's been radios, whether it's been uh, new forms of power. 0 to 5% is a difficult one. After 5%, it skyrockets. And electric cars are proving to be exactly the same. The estimation is that um, roughly by the end of, uh, by the end of this decade, uh, 25 to 50%, depending on where you are on the planet, cars will be electric vehicles. And I've got a graph that shows that later. But in order to do that, we need to expand the grid. Why? Because the draw of an average electric car is four times that of a house. So let's say that we meet by 2025, 15% um, more cars are electric. On my street, that would mean there would be four more electric vehicles. Four more electric vehicles, in addition to the one that's already there, the fifth vehicle, is the equivalent of 20 new houses. And 20 new houses on a street that was designed for far fewer um, reduces the life of the local transformer by about 30%. So we have to upgrade the grid and we have to upgrade switch boxes. And why is it so much? Well, it's because every single night we're recharging 7,104 roughly AA-sized batteries, which all sit inside a Tesla. Um, and there's five of those. Now, imagine if you get to the point where half of the cars on the road are, are you know, electric cars. Massive reduction in the life of our local infrastructure, which will need to be upgraded. Who's going to pay for it? The utilities are really worried about this because they don't know who's going to pay for this upgrade in infrastructure. The cost of upgrading infrastructure will reach into the billions. Um, so let's look at things that might be able to, the other areas where we're going to have to look at it, storage. So one way to deal with intermittency and dispatchability is to convert the power that's been created by wind and solar into a storable source. So there's battery storage. Um, Tesla's doubling down on this in a big way you know, through conventional batteries. But then there's the impact on lithium and ion and lithium mining. It's a huge amount of lithium ion, and there's going to be an industry in lithium recycling, which is growing. The second is pump storage. But again, that's geographically dependent. Pump storage is where you take the electricity, pump water up a hill uh, at night, and then have it come down, and then essentially use, uh, use, use hydro generation to generate power off it as it comes back downhill. 
that's geographically dependent. The most likely form of storage that we're looking at right now is hydrogen. But hydrogen is a very complicated story. Um, firstly, I just want to dispel one thing. I don't think hydrogen is going to be a transport fuel. I know that people talk about electricity and hydrogen being sort of electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles competing. I think hydrogen perhaps has a, a, a role in long haul transport, so very long haul or in fact tankers. But I don't think it has a, a place in the, in the EV space. As battery storage, however, I think it does have potential and uh, we are engaged in a number of um, studies right now to look at the viability of hydrogen as a, as, a, as a battery source. There are some problems though. It's expensive to produce. There are several ways to produce it, clean ways and unclean ways. Um, there's unclean ways that you can clean up, so which is, which is blue hydrogen, essentially steam reforming of methane, where you split methane to be able to create hydrogen. And if you capture the carbon, then it's reasonably effective. The cleanest way is electrolysis, which is you know, simply splitting water. Um, it's expensive, but that will probably be the most likely way of doing it, as long as you're using recyclable means, reusable and renewable ways of being able to generate the electricity. The other problem with hydrogen is it's very difficult to transport. Um, it's hard to transport, it's hard to store. If you carry it in the existing networks, it embrittles the steel pipes that it's carried in. It can be blended with natural gas, but then it makes it quite difficult because you have energy loss. And here's the other interesting thing, which not many people are talking about. because Everybody's being very excited about hydrogen. Hydrogen is clean if you burn it in the presence of pure oxygen. But that's typically not how it's going to be burned. It's going to be burnt in the air. If it's burnt in the air, it actually produces NOx, uh, nitrogen oxide, which is 240 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. What I'm trying to explain is no such thing as free lunch. And again, if we were to deal with the waste issue, which is, as I said, significant portion of our energy draw, that would be a, a significant mover. Let's look at just energy as it's currently being used. We currently generate enough electricity to, to, to feed most of our cities. And this would be true around the world in most Western democracies. The issue is not necessarily the amount that we produce, it's when we produce it. So the issue that we have is that in the middle of the day, when there's lots of energy being used, we have a peak. So the question is, how do we get over that peak? There was such a big focus in Europe on renewables, and I'm a real proponent of renewables. Um, I started my career in, in offshore wind. Um, but actually now, if you look at the hill that's associated with regeneration in, uh, in renewables generation in that diagram, in some parts of Europe, that peak is above average capacity. And that poses a problem. It poses a problem because it means that too much renewable energy is being produced at the wrong time, flooding the grid with power. And if Europe is anything like where North America will go, um, investors are no longer doing pure play wind. And the reason for that is that they're being fined for putting too much energy on the grid at the wrong time, surplus energy. So what's happening, the market's finding a way and what's happening is that investors are investing in renewables and gas power, CCGT, and that's to manage load and variability. So load variability is gonna be managed really through, through gas, switching gas turbines on and off through the day in order to feed this, this excess power. The other thing that's being done for peak generation, and I'm really interested in residential and commercial environments, and we're looking at this, is smart grids. So local generation, and also, and this is I, I really, really quite interesting, if you are going to have the level of take up of electric vehicles that we're predicting, essentially, it means that 25% of the cars on the road by the end of 2030 in Canada will essentially be batteries. So we have a program within WSP where we're able to predict um, demographic growth. So we've got 93% of Ontario mapped. We can check what developments can be like in the next four or five years, which buildings are going up, where cars can be parked for a long period of time. And we can actually work with developers to develop a plan where essentially we draw from the electric cars while they're parked to power the building at peak times and then push it back to the car off peak and away they go. Now there's a small deterioration on the battery, but we can pay people for the advantage and still have, have the cost benefit. So there's some interesting things that are being done around peaking at the local distribution level municipally and also at the generation, at the generating level. So let's now come back to Canada and the Canadian commitments. We talked about the 30 gigatons globally. What is Canada doing? 
Well, the last reliable measurement was in 2016, 815 megatons produced by Canada. And the commitment was to reduce emissions by uh, 227 megatons uh, in 2019 through a series of measures looking at efficiency in buildings, essentially moving to heat pumps, uh, emissions reductions in oil and gas, primarily through methane, um, looking at electricity uh, generation, heavy industry, essentially to, to bring it down. That has not materially manifested yet, still being tracked. But if all those measures are put in place, it still doesn't get Canada to where Canada wants to be by 2030, which is 511 megatons. There's a 77 megaton gap. So the Paris commitment, 30% below 2005 levels by 2030, that would be the, the 511. And to push it down further, the reason why I think it's important for us to look at this is that Canada has to look at its place globally rather than just, just as a country in its own right. Right now, 83% of Canada's energy is clean. 83% of energy in electricity produced in Canada comes from hydro, wind, solar, and nuclear. 60% hydro, uh, wind and solar about 7%, nuclear is 15%, 83% is clean. Even if we do as much as we can, current greenhouse gas emissions out of Canada is about 1.6% of global. We might push that down to about 1%. Um, that, that's great and it's laudable and it's fantastic. But what Canada could be doing is making sure emissions are, are coming down in other parts of the world, particularly in China. So the LNG Canada project is a really good one to show that we could actually displace coal in China. So the, the net effect from Canada could be huge, particularly the amount of natural gas we have in close proximity to China, transportable. Should Canada get a credit for what it's doing globally in that regard? Absolutely. Absolutely, because we're all in it together and we've got to take out the 30 gigatons. That's the big issue. So let's look at what's driving the changes in transportation and in, in residential usage and in commercial usage. And the big issue really is electrification. And let's look at electrification. It's being driven by three major factors, the electrification of transportation, electrification of heat, electrification of data. Um, Transport, as I mentioned, electric vehicles, don't have to do that again. You can see the adoption rate by 2030. In some places, there could be up to 50% adoption of electric cars. Of heat, that's really driven by heat pumps, moving from air conditioning to, to heat pumps, more reliable, more efficient. They tend to be more energy efficient as well. Uh, they are, on the whole, the way the industry is going, and, and, that, and that's going to continue. The other one that's not really spoken about much is data. The use of data is incredible. 20% of all electricity produced in the next couple of years is going to be to drive data. And it's being driven by data centers, data storage. It's being driven by this sort of thing, video conferencing, and the effect of COVID as a black swan event. I think we're going to see more video conferencing. To give you an example of the draw of energy, data in terms of a means of drawing electricity Watching a Netflix movie is equivalent to boiling a kettle eight to 10 times. Uh, for an Englishman like me, it's equivalent to about 66 cups of tea. 66 cups of tea, one Netflix movie. So a huge amount of data. That's contributing to the 20%. The next thing I would probably say is if we look at um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's been in the news recently. Bitcoin is currently using more energy than Switzerland. A, a staggering amount of energy. And just because we don't see it, because we plug into the wall, that energy is being taken out elsewhere. Now, the issue is actually not necessarily how much energy is being used, but it's actually where it's being produced and how it's being produced. If it's being produced through you know, geothermal energy or it's being produced through, through um, uh, hydro, then that's relatively clean. But if it's been produced through coal, that's really difficult. And that's true anywhere here. And again, I'd say to any of my my neighbors in Alberta, if they're driving uh, a Tesla right now, what they're doing is they're actually feeding the coal industry because most electricity in Alberta is produced through coal. Um, in other places, electric vehicles are absolutely the right choice. They complete the right choice because energy is produced, produced relatively cleanly. So have you noticed that in this conversation, we've gone from decarbonization straight to electrification? We've gone from oil and gas to, so this is the transition from Exxon to Elon. We're talking about electrification. The important thing to realize is that electrification is not decarbonization. And while we as a society are starting to do this, we're starting to 
correlate electrification with decarbonization, they're not the same thing. So let me try and explain that through, through this slide. There are all manner of means to be able to produce electricity. And if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, the green, uh, green energies, the renewable energies, they're great. They're actually the cheapest way to create electricity right now. Uh, a lot of them are actually, as I said, they're geographically dependent. But the dispatchable intermittency is one that you could solve through battery usage. The real issue is you can't get the volumes. It's the volume of energy that's required. They just don't get to that level of volume. So if you look at this, coal is the one that I push far to the left. It's the one that really has to be almost eliminated as a, as a source fuel. Then we look at gas. Gas can be gray. Gas and oil can be gray. They can be, they can be exceptionally dirty. However, if you, if you use them efficiently and if you capture the me uh, methane associated with, with releases, that makes a big difference. Then you look at storage, hydrogen. Now, hydrogen can be clean and dirty, as I mentioned before. It can be either created through steam reforming of methane that captured, or it can be, be just generated through pure, pure by gas. I, all is to say, the solution is going to be a mix of these in some measure in order to get us to that 30 gigaton reduction. Because if we can't do it all through renewables, it's going to have to be doing using the other means that we have, but in the most efficient way we possibly can. And gas is, is, is actually seems to be right now the right candidate for variability. Again, just want to say we're, we're currently using one cubic mile of uh, oil a year. And that's going to have to be replaced in a meaningful way. So let's look at another classic example where electrification is not decarbonization. So I just looked at source generation. Now let's go back to the grid. Right? So as I mentioned, you're going to have grid upgrades when you move to an electrified future. Already talked about the demand on the grid from having more electric cars. Well, actually, there's another issue. As you have more grid infrastructure, you're going to have to build more switch boxes and switch gear and transformers because the level of electrification is going up, whether it's through data, whether it's through residential, whether it's through commercial, whether it's through cars. SF6. I'm surprised nobody's talking about this. As with, I hope, many things that I've mentioned, um, there are some intrinsic issues in the, in the energy conundrum that, that don't get raised. SF6 is one. So SF6 is sulfur hexafluoride. It is the world's worst greenhouse gas. Um, and we're using a heck of a lot of it. SF6 is the means by which switch boxes, switch gear, and transformers are insulated. Right? So they're insulated with this gas, and it's a de-arcing agent. There's no alternative right now. That's the only one that's used. And the global install base of SF6 is expected to grow by 75% by 2030. Already, SF6 emissions are equivalent to about 100 million cars. One kilogram of SF6 is equivalent to 23 and a half tons of carbon dioxide. And this is a de-arcing agent. And we're putting loads of it out there into the atmosphere right now, into the environment, certainly, through switch boxes and, and, uh, and switch gear. This is going to be a major problem for us. Depending on how we deal with this issue, this could be another one to five gigatons of carbon equivalent put into the atmosphere over the next few years. This is one that we need to find an alternative to, and there are a number of universities looking at alternatives to, to SF6, but right now this is the de-arcing agent. So this may be an unintended consequence of our drive towards electrification, and one where I continue to say electrification doesn't mean decarbonization. You know, just moving towards heat pumps, electric cars, doesn't necessarily mean, to, mean it gets you there. So, Really, I, I, I hope I'm not depressing anybody because there's <laughs> that, that, you know, it would be very easy to kind of simplify the problem. So I thought I'd use a phrase that has come to precedence recently and also before. Houston, we have a problem. Houston is the, is the center for the uh, energy industry in the US. But the last time that phrase was used was actually um, during the space age. It was Apollo 13. And for those of you not familiar with Apollo 13, if we look at the, the unprecedented level of human ingenuity and improvement and drive that resulted in the space race, um, which led to putting a man on the moon, the Apollo program was just the pinnacle of, of development and drive and excited lots of people. So the problem that we have here is that we have 
us represented in Apollo 13, which is that we are the people in the, in the vessel when the cryo tank exploded and essentially risked their lives. We don't have enough power to get home and we need to find the right combination of power that will get us back. So there's three reactions. We're running low on power. What's the combination that will get us back? The first is to be the, uh, the Ed Harris character, just devote everything to life support, put it all into renewables. We don't have the ability to do that. There isn't the volume. You couldn't get there. The, the astronauts will die on the journey. The second is to give up. That's the oil and gas industry. In some ways, those are promoting just carry and do what we're doing. You should give up. Well, just carry on burning as we currently are. That's not going to work. The right combination is actually going to be the technician. The technician in the room that actually switches everything up in the right possible way to find the right combination that gets us home. And this was Gary Sinise in a digital, in, a, in an actual twin of the module and was turning off just enough systems to give them enough life support to stay okay and enough power to get back. Moonshots won't get us there. We've only got 10 years to do this. So we can't actually be looking at new technologies. We've got to use the palette we already have with us. And that's why I'm sort of advocating for that combination that I mentioned. So what's that, what's that gonna look like? It's gonna look like more solar, more wind, definitely. We're gonna be looking at more um, uh, capturing of fugitive emissions. The capturing of waste is a huge issue. This could be significant in reducing our gigatonnage globally. Battery storage, mentioned hydrogen, mentioned uh, conventional batteries, um, and then smart grids. So local distributed energy systems. I talked about EV charging for residential buildings and commercial buildings where you actually plug into the system, pull back. Microgrids, um, and also credits. And as I mentioned, the, you know, Canada can't view itself in isolation. So there's credits at a local level, but also credits at a global level. See the contribution that Canada makes globally. And that's where I end with this slide, which is Canada is looking to reduce its emissions by 77 megatons. Actually, the real opportunity for Canada is to be part of the reduction of 30 gigatons globally. And with our background in, as an energy innovator, our steps forward with renewables, our massive resources in, in natural gas, and the ability for that to displace coal in China, there's a significant part to play. So lots to take in there. And again, just a reminder, 83% of Canada's energy is carbon free right now. So our role, continue renewables, look at natural gas and renewable natural gas, biofuels, hydrogen, LNG, and massively reduce methane. Scale new technologies that demonstrate uh, what we call in WSP a future ready mindset around charging and EVs, distributed assets, smart and digital solutions. I could go on about motors. Motors are quite interesting. Technology hasn't changed in 200 years. We could make those far more efficient, at least 30% efficient. Ethical investment is going to drive growth and collaboration and innovation is, is exceptionally important. It's one thing that we've been doing at WSP quite a lot and also investment in innovation. Again, moonshots won't get us there, but that doesn't stop us from trying to find ways of improving. That was my last slide. I realize I may have gone a little bit over on time there, Luke. No, no problem at all. That was, uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Some of the, some of the stats that uh, you had shared were, I mean, just absolutely staggering. Um, you had mentioned, I think it was something to the effect of 62,000 plus barrels per second of oil yep. that's used. And my, my simple math uh, was around 9.9 .9 million liters per second. Um, that that is, I mean, it's it's really difficult to comprehend, and so the and the scale of uh, the scale of the things that you're talking about in, in our grids and how those that power is transmission um, is is uh, I mean obviously applies to everything that we do in our day to day life whether we think about it or not. Yep. Um, so we've got we've got a little bit of time for for some questions here. Um, one of the things that jumped out uh, to me was um, the the amount of waste that uh, mm. that is not generate the amount of rate waste that is involved in <clears throat> getting our energy from the source. So what what are the sort of things that are the lower hanging fruit in in reducing some of that waste? Methane reduction. Methane reduction is absolutely huge. Methane is considered by some to be about six times more powerful than um, than uh, carbon dioxide. It's not. It's actually much, much more. It's um uh, it's about 86 times more over a 25 year cycle. It's about six times more over hundred years. So methane degrades, methane goes from methane to carbon dioxide. So over a hundred years, it's about six times more than carbon dioxide. 
Over 25 years, about 86 times. Over 10 years, it's about 240 times. So given that we're going to be doing this over, over, over 10 years, which we've got to get by 2030, methane reduction would be absolutely huge. Um, we look at, look at Europe, some of the recent um, satellite imagery actually shows that it's about a one gigaton of methane being produced and just vented through flaring, right? Through ineffective burning of methane and actually just direct venting from pigging from, uh, from, from gas fields. What we could be doing is, is, is finding that, capturing the methane and combusting it. This is one of the rare instances where actually carbon dioxide is a good thing, which where converting methane to carbon dioxide through effective combustion is actually a really good thing. Um, and, uh, so the, the got, lesser of two evils. It's the lesser of two evils, absolutely. And, and it's a significant lesser. It's actually in some ways a good because the carbon dioxide can be absorbed. So if you, if you green more, you're actually you're absorbing that carbon dioxide. You've just got to get to the point where you're taking the methane out. Interesting. Oh, thank you for that. Um, uh, some questions from our q and I encourage anyone to add questions into the chat box here through Zoom. Actually, a question from Renee Merrifield, who had suggested you as a speaker, as you said. Uh, sure. She is asking, how, how do we overcome the stigma associated with pipelines? Um, I think it's probably coming back to some of the origins behind pipelines in the first place. So we talk about XL pipeline quite a lot. To be honest, I can't imagine any American administration approving the XL pipeline. And the reason for that is it would push up the price of 50% of their oil by about 15%. And so, you know, if we really want to get to the fundamentals, the economics of why, why this is happening, I can't imagine anybody, I really cannot imagine any government in the US approving the XL pipeline because it doesn't work in their own interest. Pipelines are still the safest way to transport hydrocarbon. Um, it's, the, it's either pipelines or it's using tankers. And really right now we've got, we've got tankers coming up the St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence uh, channel, um, providing uh, oil from Saudi Arabia. That can't be a good thing. We've seen what happened with the Axon Valdez. Uh, we've actually seen what's happened recently. There's often frequent discharging. Um, I think we've got to have a, I think we've got to have a reasoned debate in the country about what the future mix is gonna be like and how we do that most efficiently. I think we do need to wean ourselves off to the extent of hydrocarbons that we've had, there's no doubt about it. But does that mean that we wean it off completely 100%? As we look from the numbers, we just can't do it that easily. Mm. Right? So um, what we should be looking at is the right solution for Canada and actually the means to be able to get those hydrocarbons, whether it's gas, um, whether it's cleanly produced oil to the coast. Um, but I don't want to enter into a, into a political debate about sure. that. That's, that's not my role. No, no problem. Uh, okay, and uh, the question here with regards to um, Canada's push to look at reduction of carbon emissions globally rather than simply within a kind of our borders. And you mentioned a project um, like LNG Canada as, as related to China. Are there other areas that we should be considering as a nation uh, in terms of our global impact? Uh, yeah, we, we look at our global impact in terms of our neighbor to the south. I think there's going to be a resurgent investment in renewables. That's going to be something that we can definitely help with, with the level of innovation we've got. Um, uh, export into Southeast Asia through China and Japan. Um, the conversations that I had with Christy Clark were really around, around Korea, Japan and, and China and the amount of energy growth there's going to be there and how we can influence, influence those markets. And there's also circuitous links into, into India. Now, from the East Coast, we've looked at potential channels to market into Europe, because um, right now Europe is being fed quite a lot, quite a lot by, by Russian gas, and the geopolitics of Russian gas are quite difficult. Germany is heavily dependent on gas from Russia. Um, so actually Canada's role as a, as, a, as a producer, generator, and transporter of energy is actually still very, very valid on that, on that landscape. That's a very interesting way to think about it. I hadn't thought about it or I've been uh, listened to that in those terms. Um, so we're, we're running short on time. Maybe just one quick other, qu it may not be a quick answer, but you know, a quick answer you might have on any solutions that might be coming down the, the pipeline, pardon the pun on sulfur hexafluoride and that, that issue around how that's used in, in transformers and that sort of thing is very interesting. Yeah, there's some interesting research being done in universities for alternatives. Um, right now, there isn't one, but as I said, there, there's, there's alternatives in development. The question again is time. And, and it's, do we have the time to find an alternative and how quickly can we bring it to the market? As I said, we're in an existential crisis. We need to take out 30 gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere in the next 10 years. 
you know, we're already into the 2020s, we're well into them. Um, and it's really going to be done by looking at, I think, fundamentally the waste issue for methane, um, looking at um, finding more efficient means of transmission of, of, of the energy. Um, but yeah, sulfur hexafluoride is a, is a real issue. And it's not talked about very much, which is interesting for me. Um, but as I said, in a well-meaning way, it's the Ed Harris's, right? We've got to solve this problem. We've got to get them home alive. We're moving towards electrification, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Electrification comes with some fundamental issues and those have to be addressed. Now, I'm an optimist. I'm a technological optimist. I believe there are people finding technical solutions all the time. It's about bringing to the market. But again, it's just making sure that before we get into the narrowness of doing one particular solution, looking at the long-term effect of it and ensuring that we're actually achieving the, the fundamental goal, which is decarbonization. There's an interesting set of questions as well there that I can see on, on, on energy, but, but I, I'm, I'm happy to answer those off. Yeah, and actually, uh, I, this happened in our last webinar. What I might suggest is if you're okay with it, we might send sure. some more uh, questions through to you uh, to answer, and then we can follow up with the membership because it's uh, it's kind of hard to get to all the questions in the, in the time that we have. But yeah. respecting the time, I, I do want to thank you today, Savender, to for joining us. That was a uh, um, it was a, it was a, it's a complex set of, of challenges that we're faced with and you think you did a great job of tr trying to summarize some of the key areas we should be thinking about so on behalf of you at Okanagan I really appreciate you joining us today you're very, very welcome thank you very much for having me thank you okay so uh, with that again I would uh, certainly like to thank everybody for joining us today um, and I would like to especially thank our sponsor Canadian Western Bank uh, for supporting the webinar today. As always, if you have any uh, comments or recommendations for, uh, for future events or any of the work that UDI is doing, we have contact information for Jennifer Dixon, our executive director here. You can also follow us through various channels on our, on our website and also uh, in the social channels that are provided there. Our next webinar will take place on April 29th. So mark your calendars for that and stay tuned for more information. And until then, hope you all take care and thanks very much for joining us today. Bye.